Good morning. Good morning and welcome. Welcome to Santa Barbara Museum of Arts uh, live from Oaxaca webinar. Um, I am Tina Villadolid, senior teaching artist for the museum, and I am going to wait a few seconds more for people to connect to the webinar. Um, thank you so much for joining us. I'm just going to wait a few more moments to let people come in. Welcome. Good morning. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for joining us, everyone. Uh, my name is Tina Villadolid. I'm a senior teaching artist for the Santa Barbara Museum of Art. And I am so happy to be here to uh, present to you a wonderful opportunity um, to connect with uh, Florencio Moreno, who is a cultural geography scholar. Um, and he is uh, in Oaxaca with an artisan, Adelina Pedro Martinez. Um, I will let Florencio introduce her, but she is a third generation potter. Um, and just for our viewers, I want to inform you that uh, Florencio and Adelina are live in a small village in Oaxaca, uh, San Bar Bartolo Coyotepec. And it is a small pueblo where um, internet connectivity is not uh, very strong. So please bear with us through this webinar. Um, the sound may be a little bit spotty, um, but what I am going to do is I'm going to try to ask Florencio and Adelina to repeat if the sound does drop out. And also please know that at the bottom of the, the screen of this Zoom broadcast, at the two, there's a toolbar and on the far right, Q&A. If you click on that, that is where you can type in any questions. So please type in your questions. And at the end of the hour, um, after Florencio and um, Adelina make their presentation and we do get a little tour of Adelina's work, um, there will be an opportunity for me to pose your questions to Florencio. Um, so without any further delay, I will introduce Florencio. Florencio Moreno is a cultural geography scholar with concentrations in colonial iconography, iconology, and astroarchaeology. As a member of the Astronomical Society of Oaxaca, Florencio teaches at local schools and also lectures within and outside of Mexico on Mesoamerican and Mexican anthropology and history. He is a native of Oaxaca and fluent in English, French, Spanish, and Zapotec. His broad knowledge and expertise of colonial iconography, history, and archaeology, as well as his affable personality, make him a favorite tour guide lecturer of Santa Barbara Museum of Art travelers. Thank you so much, Florencio, for being here with us. And uh, please, please introduce to us Adelina. Gladly. Thank you for inviting us. And yes, uh, we're in a small village called San Bartolo Coyotepec. It's uh, south of the city of Oaxaca. It's a very traditional village. And in this village, there are many, many families that dedicate themselves to the creation of uh, pottery that uniquely is black, which has made this community extremely, extremely famous. Adelina is one of seven brothers and sisters of a large family. Their last name is Pedro Martinez. And she, along with her brothers and sisters, all are potters. Uh, and they learned it since they were young. Uh, there is a photo in her gallery studio that we can later see of her when she was four years old, already sitting, making her first pots. Uh, as a way of play, but little by little, as you can imagine, you learn more and more and more, and Adelina has become a true, very important potter that has made the category of a great master of Mexican folk art. 
great masters of Mexican folk art is a very privileged um, denomination or given uh, recognition to artists in all of our country that exceed uh, regular artists with uh, excellent work. And Adelina is one of those in her community. Adelina uh, also, aside from the multiple things that she does during the year, she's also one of those very talented artists that makes very special Day of the Dead art, which is basically what she's working on now. She has a few pieces that she's already exhibiting from simple pieces uh, to more complicated pieces because there are a wide range of people that look for Day of the Dead items and especially locals and especially in clay because in clay there is a very, very interesting uh, moldable way of making it and she can include myths and legends into some of the work that she does because Day of the Dead is so amazingly broad in the many things that we do that there is no limit there are, there is no real only one thing done there's a multiple multiple set of, uh, of traditional things that are done and a lot of us come to adelina for example when we want to have uh customized pieces done and put our names on the skulls or if you're going to give a gift to someone put their name on the skull put a date on the skull and these are amazing gifts that really are very inexpensive given the uh, the abundance of clay but uh, but at the same time makes a, an, an extraordinary oaxacan uh symbol these blacks these black skulls and of course we are already in the month of uh, day of the dead uh, unfortunately we can't see from here but outside where we are there are fields and fields covered with marigolds coxcombs black-eyed susans and the multiple type of flowers that are grown specially for this time of year and little by little our markets are going to be flooded with the other dead items our markets are going to be flooded with breads flooded with uh, special food oaxaca has a very special tradition of um of making a very special type of bread that actually looks like a body or a burial wrap. And they embed a face at one end of the loaf so that it looks very peculiar, which is what we simply call pan de muerto, which literally means day of the dead bread. And just like uh, many things are all gathering close enough to day of the dead, uh, bakers will soon stop making all the multiple variety of breads they do and concentrate exclusively 24 7 to the making of day of the dead bread okay so then why all this well this is extremely important day of the dead for us todos santos um fieles difuntos uh, many names we give them are very special traditions which have roots in the mesoamerican era where the ancient uh, settlers in this case zapotecs in the valley of oaxaca uh, had already traditions that were blended in with roman catholic traditions introduced by dominican friars who had extended to on november 2nd the, the tradition of all souls uh, in uh, just decades before the, their arrival in, uh, in the new world. So then this is a very important aspect that allowed the people here to continue on their practices because the way of syncretism that the Catholic Church included, the honorable respect that ancient people gave to their, to their departed, uh, allowed it to become a Christian festival, permitted, and then of course in big cities like the city of Oaxaca, Puebla, Mexico City, Merida, the cities that were first uh, populated, uh, it leaned totally 
towards the Roman Catholic tradition of all saints and all souls. And people would celebrate not the dead necessarily, but the poor. Uh, gifts would be given to the poor. Everyone would go to see the altars of relics in their cathedrals, admire the remains of the saints, uh, have special bake, bake, bakers uh, make tamales and breads in the form of bones of saints. And it became so well seen by the church that it stayed. On the other hand, in areas like where we are, Oaxaca, where we have, as we speak, 14 different ethnic nations, all of which have their own language, their own style of dress, their own identity, their own uh, history behind them. Some of them created amazing uh, ancient cities. Some of them were traitors, but there's a root of people here that in their own way, retain their own special ways of celebrating their departed in ways that the Catholic Church basically didn't see as bad. And people today still practice quite unique things that you would be surprised uh, by seeing. For example, one of these things is the tradition of Mortahar. For example, if you look at this little skeleton, uh, this little skeleton has a baby uh, with it, okay? Uh, and it's very important because traditionally, when uh, in the Mesoamerican tradition, there were multiple destinations after um, afterlife, uh, but one of them was that if a child passed for whatever reason, because the child did not sin, because the child was too innocent and didn't have time to sin, then those children would be considered special and would be sent back to a very special region of the underworld called the Chichihualcuauco, it's a long word. And from there, the gods would place them back into privileged mother's wombs so that the children would be considered like an immediate sinless reincarnation. Well, this is important because in many of the communities, when a child uh, passes, uh, traditionally, what the community does is dress them as if they were going to be uh, baptized, dress them as if they were going to get married, and then decorate a special box for them uh, have godparents come and throw candy and fruit, brass bands. And part of the tradition is to rejoice the fact that that child would become an angel, angelito. Okay, and that way, it, it would sound bizarre if you don't know the tradition, but just at the same time that a family is in, is in pain because of, the lo because of the loss of their child, they have to go out and dance with the brass band because that's part of the ritual. So Day of the Dead brings together so many special things to us, so many special traditions that we all basically see because we all basically are born with it. And personally, I can tell you my own stories of uh, being a child. I, rem I, rem I remember our dad, bringing blankets to the graveyard uh, the night that we spent there and they're wrapping us up like tacos, you know, where, where we wouldn't be able to move because it was cold, okay? But at the same time, kept warm and had to stay. There was no such thing as, do you want to go or would you like to go? We just had to go, okay? And that's a tradition that eventually builds on you. And now as a parent, you do the same thing and take your own children and uh, hope that they will take their children and their children and that this continues as it has been for what we estimate approximately 2,500 years, okay? Uh, as I said earlier, that we're building up to the date because for us, Day of the Dead strongly begins on October 31st. On October 31st at 3 p.m., in most communities like this one, 
the bells begin to, to ring, fireworks begin to sound, because that's when we believe the spirits of the angels begin to arrive to visit, okay? As we speak in this community, people believe that humans or people um, keep their heart after death, animals don't. They lose it upon death. They believe that people have mortal and immortal aspects. Animals only have mortal ones. They believe that even though the stomach and mind dies at death, the heart abandons the body and joins the spirit. And then every year, when it's when holes open in the atmosphere, which are created by the fireworks, the spirits descend to be among their loved ones. Okay, and we have all these stories around us that, for example, somebody left the chair facing the altar, and then in a little while, when you return to the altar room, uh, the chair is not there anymore; it's facing another way. Somebody moved it. We all believe in the presence of our loved ones. Okay, so on October 31st, the spirits of the departed children, the angels arrive, and we must honor that. With, with that also begins the offerments we do, both in our homes and also in our graveyards. In our homes, we go that morning to the market to buy the freshest possible, and in our homes, we make these very special altar tributes to our loved ones, okay, that include fruits, flowers, uh, aromas that are familiar with our memory of them. At the same time, our relatives are preparing food. And by this, I mean, just like your beautiful tradition of Thanksgiving, where all your families meet, for us, Day of the Dead is something very similar to that dear tradition you have of Thanksgiving, because wherever we live, we all must be back to the main home for Day of the Dead. So then you can imagine my sisters and, and uh, nieces and mother and everyone cooking. Uh, and what I mean to say is that we're, we're also living in a very special, um, cuisine region, gastronomical region of Mexico, where we have very special moles created, very special tamales, and very special foods created that we can only have on Day of the Dead. Because Day of the Dead is when the effort is worth it. Day of the Dead is when definitely um, women spend two, three days in the kitchen to have the best mole ready for the afternoon of October 31st. Because if we're remembering grandfather so-and-so that liked a very special uh, chichilo mole or a special peanut mole or a special black mole or a special green mole or a special almond mole, we make those moles and we make them that day because we want that aroma, that smell to attract them when they arrive, okay? And the first that arrive are the children. Okay, when we're finished with that, then uh, decorating the altar, we put uh, photographs of them there. We put uh, many things that bring us back to their memory, a coin, something that connects us with our loved ones. We actually sanctify it by lighting incense. We make a sand altar in front of the, uh, of the altar. The sand altar is very important because we have a tradition that when someone passes for the following nine days, we do a novenary of prayers. We pray the rosary for nine days in the person's home and we build a sand altar. Uh, let's imagine that if the person was devout to St. John the Baptist, we'll, we'll make the sand altar in the shape of St. John the Baptist with colored sands and uh, twinkling lights and as, as best as we can. And on the ninth day, we, we take it apart and we go to the graveyard and we put it over their grave. 
Okay, so every year on Day of the Dead, we make a sand altar complementing our main altar, okay, and sanctify it all by placing incense and candles and making sure that we replace them once they're getting uh, low or once they're finishing all night, okay? When we have the altar done, then the next stage is we go to the graveyard and we do the same thing there. We actually bring buckets and shovels and things and we clean the grave first and then we spend a couple of hours decorating it. And then we spend the entire night in their wake. Traditionally, in all our grave sites, the, the, the graves are aligned east to west. And this is a tradition which concurred with the Mesoamerican custom of having the feet facing west as they believe that when the sun set, even though it darkened our living world, it lit the underworld, which is why we go spend one of their days with them. It also concurred in the Roman Catholic tradition of placing the body with the head facing east, which is Jerusalem, and also having the body laid out as Christ was descended from the cross. So then this is the reason why it stayed and it became formal that in the, that in the graveyards we have this east-west alignment, okay? And this is something that we all honor with the decorations that we put that night. We have multiple later events that take place that the following day, like the famous comparsas where, where it becomes a very fun carnival style. Families spend the whole year making these very special um, outfits, uh, costumes, so that we can look like spirits. And we dance with brass bands to the streets. We also spend an entire night visiting relatives and friends and bringing them a memento. Okay, so if I know that, say, my neighbor knew, uh, if I knew my neighbor's grandfather, and if I knew that my neighbor's grandfather liked apples, I'll bring an apple to him and put it on his altar. And respectfully, he will eventually visit our home and put something else in our altar. And this is how if you're walking around at 2, 3 o'clock in the morning with an incredible number of people and all over the streets of our communities visiting each other because practically we don't sleep for about three days. Uh, the spirits of the angels leave on November 2nd, uh, November 1st, on November 1st, the same thing, the bells of the church, fireworks, and that's when the spirits of the adults arrive, okay, and stay with us until November 2nd, when they leave, and as they leave, some communities have a very special way of saying farewell and they'll do a last wake and some communities after 3 p.m on uh, november 2nd will begin to make little boxes from their good contents left on the altar and then give them all out and a lot of us what we do is we we go out and give it to our local church or we go out and and, and give some of that to the homeless, okay? And then that night or the following day, depending how tired everyone is, then that's our big family meal, okay? So this is uh, just an idea, just a brief overview of what really the multiple traditions of Day of the Dead are. And as I'm speaking, you can see how Adelina is very quickly uh, working on this skeleton that is part of a real piece that she's actually going to do. Uh, you, you, you need to know that this is the only community in all of Oaxaca that has a clay that turns black when you fire it in the kiln. The oxidization of the minerals in it, plus the density of the smoke in these oxygen reduction pits that they use, make it black. Okay, no shine, no glaze, Nothing but simply the quality of the clay makes it black. And it's famous of Oaxaca. Decades ago, a lot of our mezcal was sold inside jugs of uh, black pots. And people loved it because you had both the liquid inside plus the actual bottle that you could keep as a memento of Oaxaca, of your visit to Oaxaca. Um, 
and uh, from that, so many, many things. Um, so then, this is how the clay looks when it comes out of their quarries. Their quarries are in this community, and only members of this community can access them. Okay, we have in Oaxaca further something we call usos y costumbres, which is their own legal structure, which is very important because this ha this is their own parliament that they have, and they make their own community decisions, and neither the state nor federal governments can interfere with the decisions that are taken in each of these communities. So if the community says, by law, you must prove that you're native to here, to have access to the quarry, then of course, that is a law and everybody honors that. So a potter from another village uh, 20 miles away can't come and buy this, can come and do this. And this is a way to only allow families here if they wish to, to participate in the production of making black pottery, okay? Um, so I'm going to ask Adelina to share with us a little bit of her view uh, of Day of the Dead. ¿Cómo es la festividad de muertos aquí en San Bartolo? I'm asking her how the Day of the Dead traditions are in her town. Sí, pues la festividad de San Bartolo es muy muy costumbrista porque nosotros vamos aprendiendo de de nuestros mayores, de nuestros abuelos, nos van enseñando como eh, nos van transmitiendo más bien el 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 conocimiento de cómo entendieron ellos la, la vida después o la muerte después de la vida. Y entonces para nuestros uh, antepasados, pues la muerte era pues una parte muy importante después de, de la vida. Y entonces a uh, nosotros nos han enseñado que, que el recordar a los, a, los, a los muertos, pues es una parte esencial De, de los que quedamos en, en, en esta vida. Entonces los festejamos de una manera bien, este, pues, muy interesante también, ¿no? Porque eh, los festejamos con, con los olores, con los colores, con, con todo lo que nuestras, nuestros abuelos pensaban que era la esencia que ellos solamente podían eh, recibir a través de, de eso, ¿no? De, de los olores y de los colores sobre todo. Por eso en, en el Día de Muertos pues se festeja poniendo flores como el, el semposuche, como le decimos aquí, que es las flores amarillas que tienen un color bien intenso y un olor bien intenso también. Perfecto. So Adelina is saying that here the day of the dead is extremely traditional. This is a village that has kept many, many traditions and the grandparents, parents are the ones that make sure that the flow of knowledge and practice of this uh, servants is kept uh, because since very little uh, they are taught uh, to definitely honor your passwords, to make sure that you respectfully remember them, that you respectfully think of them, that you always have them present. And therefore, with colors, with, with aromas, and many things, um, the community enlivens completely. Okay, one of the things that, if they're not up right now, but I'm sure some of you are familiar with uh, something called papel picado, which is a type of cutout paper, where all the streets are covered with a cutout paper and images of Day of the Dead. Okay. El mole, ¿no? El mole, el chocolate. Porque yo recuerdo que mi abuela eh, este, empezaba a hacer el mole, a prepararlo como una semana antes, ¿no? De, de Día de Muertos. Y era este, asar muchos chiles de diferentes aromas. Y entonces eso en el pueblo olía, todo el pueblo olía a mole, ¿no? A chocolate. Porque el chocolate también se preparaba como una cuestión muy especial. Entonces ahora la ofrenda es hacerles este, un altar especial donde se le dedique todo lo que se le pone con el afán de que los, los que ya están en otra dimensión 
pues les llegue la esencia ¿no? de, los, de los olores y que ellos compartan con nosotros que estamos vivos, pues lo que se les ofrenda, ¿no? Porque eh, si comemos en el día de, de, de el día primero y el día 2 de noviembre que se festeja a los, a los adultos, pues comemos y el, un plato de lo que estamos comiendo se pone en el altar, como haciendo de cuenta que al que se le está haciendo su ofrenda está ahí sentado comiendo con nosotros, ¿no? So then, Adelina is mentioning uh, that in terms of aromas, uh, Sempol Suchitu is the native name of Marigold, which has a very, very strong aroma, which is something that uh, particularly is in all our fields right now, people's planted specifically because they know the demand is so high. Uh, but also, uh, traditionally, the creation of the molets. Uh, Adelina says that she remembers her grandmother would begin making the mole about a week before Day of the Dead, meaning making it, as you say, from scratch, making uh, all of the different uh, chilies that, that have to be literally Uh, baked, burnt on a comal, which is a very old-fashioned clay board type of pan. And they, it has to have time and seasoning. So she says, I remember that our village, all our village smelled like mole because multiple families were making their own mole. It's chocolate, which is another special uh, part of our of day of the dead because we associate chocolate with the breads that are sold, that we actually dip them. These are dipping breads to eat, to eat with the hot chocolate. Uh, mezcal, for example, is a very important part of the ritual tradition as well, uh, of, of Day of the Dead. And she says, when we had food, whenever we sat down to eat, we always put an additional plate in our altar. Because just like we were serving for all of us alive, those that stay here, those that we are here alive, we also include them in our meals, include, include our loved ones in our meals. Entonces, este, se, se esmera, se sigue uno esmerando por hacer el día muy especial, el día, desde el día 31 de octubre, ese día es especial para los angelitos, que son los niños que murieron muy jóvenes, y ese día pues se pone un altar dedicado a los niños, todo relativo a, a los niños, ¿no? Si son panes, son pequeñitos, se les pone incluso juguetes dulces, ¿no? Como ofrenda. Ese es dedicado al día 31. Y ya si el día 2, pues ya es dedicado a los adultos y es, pues es un, un altar dedicado muy especial porque se le pone ofrenda de todo lo que nosotros considerábamos que le gustaba a la persona o a las personas que están dedicadas a la ofrenda, ¿no? Entonces se le pone desde el mezcal, el chocolate, las frutas, las frutas muy olorosas que son de temporada, como las limas. Las limas es una fruta muy olorosa y muy especial, ¿no? Y ya de ahí es tradicional ponerle los cacahuates, las nueces, las jícamas, la caña, todo lo que está de temporada. So she says, uh... Definitely with the aromas and the creation of special things. Uh, for us, uh, the 30, 31st of October are very special. We receive the children here in, this, in, the, in our town with their own special altar. And because the, they're angels and because they passed when they were children, uh, we put toys, we put uh, smaller breads, we put uh, all things related to children which is different from the next day when the adults arrive, we put more things, we add things that adults that remember us, like a shot of mezcal, uh, some of the dishes, very aromatic fruits, like for example, lemon, is very aromatic, uh, jicama, peanuts, um, peanuts, uh, pecans, we have uh, the use of sugar cane, los nísperos, los nísperos. Local pots, um, all of these are seasonal fruits that we have in abundance in our markets. It is, um, it is amazing seeing um, a market in the Day Dead. We have one um, in the city of Oaxaca, which is a huge market that, in, that all communities come to, 
to bring things. And they had they make a very special Day of the Dead uh, area, which is uh, the most amazing, the most amazing amount of things that you can see in the market. So Day of the Dead in all of us has a variation. Uh, simply because everyone is proud of their own community traditions and they want to make their traditions a little bit different from the nearing village and a little bit different from another village. So we have villages here that even exclusively wait and exclusively celebrate November 2nd in the afternoon as a bid farewell. We have other villages that wait until November 3rd and at that day, once all the main family affairs are done, that's when it's a must going to their, to their cemetery and they're having live brass bands. And one of the other things which is very special for Day of the Dead is uh, the fact that at the beginning of the 1900s, when in the era right before the Mexican Revolution of 1910, right at the time in which our new identity as a modern Mexico is created, an amazing graphic artist, Jose Guadalupe Posada, in a very satiric and very uh, sarcastic way, began to make critique of Mexican officials, especially of the great Mexican leaders, by making them skeletons. Soon after that, Diego Rivera, our famous painter, made it world known with his murals like a Sunday afternoon in the Alameda Park, which is a mural that you can still see in Mexico City, where he creates the famous Katrina, the famous image of the first lady in a very chic dress from Paris and a little poodle with an umbrella and instead of a scarf, a feathered serpent around her, reminding us of our origin from Quetzalcoatl, and one way or the other, making uh, shows of skeletons dancing, having a fiesta with devils, uh, embracing angels and making a joke. And further, uh, journalists loved this so much that they started to create critique of famous people, good or bad, that only comes out on November 2nd. So a lot of us, I, I personally, I go to my nearby newsstand and I give and I pay the man for all the newspapers that come out that day. And I come back in the afternoon to pick them up because every single newspaper has a section of calaveras, which is a section of poems. And these poems are critiques of the things that we live with right now but in a funny way, okay, in a funny way. Uh, I'm going to read you one, a very simple one, um, and this is called La Suegra, okay? Con singular sutileza, su nariz en todo metía, para suerte de la nuera, la calaca la quería. Pobre de la suegra metiche, su vida la arrebató, pues la muerte sin vergüenza, sin pensarlo se la llevó. Okay, this is about a mother-in-law, and it says, with very precise subtleness, she put her nose into everything. Good luck for the daughter-in-law, because the skeleton liked her. Poor mother-in-law, um, nosy, because her life was taken. The the skeleton didn't think of it twice and took her with, with her. Uh, it doesn't rhyme in English. Of course, in Spanish it rhymes. But as you can imagine, every year, we all look forward to reading and sitting around the family and cracking up because they talk about the politicians. There'll be definitely one about uh, Donald Trump, of course. There'll be many about our president many about our national uh, soccer heroes, about our uh, artists, about our local governors, mayors, and this is the only day of the year in which journalists can get away with it, okay, can get away and make a real strong critique 
about them. Okay, so this is all part of, in a simple, fast way we can share about Day of the Dead. And as you saw, this beautiful skeleton that Adelina is making, we're going to take the camera to her studio to show you finished ones. So you can see the incredible talent of Adelina uh, once the pieces are finished. And we will be glad to answer any questions that, that you may have or, or extend a little more if, if, if it's necessary. Incluso también, pues no sé si puedo abundar un poquito, de, de la costumbre de nosotros es eh, visitar a los altares de, de nuestros padrinos o de nuestros familiares cercanos y hacerles llevar, llegar una ofrenda también ¿no? Al, a los altares. Y entre esas ofrendas, pues, llevamos los panes, las veladoras o las velas, pero también hay quienes este, ofrendan un, un cráneo, una calavera de cualquier otro material para ponerlo en el altar haciendo alusión a los que ya trascendieron a otra dimensión, ¿no? Y, y no lo vemos como algo este, eh, de religioso ni mucho menos, sino solamente como una representación del estado natural en el que imaginamos que ahora viven los que se fueron. Adelina wants to add that definitely one of the things that is important that they do is that they will visit their godparents, um, their relatives, their friends, and bring a token to their altar, including uh, sometimes skeletons. And she says, this, is, this has nothing religious about it. There's nothing uh, religiously thinking. It is something that we do to honor in the family that we're visiting. Basically, those that have reached another dimension, those that have gone ahead of us in a glad, in a glad way. Entonces, este, por eso se, es común ver en los altares las calaveras de barro negro, de barro colorado o de dulce, ¿no? Porque son una representación solamente alusiva eh, con un motivo de alegría recordar a los que ya no están. And she says, and that's why it's very common that in all the altars you see a variety of skeletons made from clay, made from different type of colored clay, made from candy, meaning sugar, uh, amaranth, uh, chocolate, so many different things um, that, that, that we actually have. Y que tenemos presente y, y muy viva la enseñanza de nuestros abuelos. Por ejemplo, yo ahora que mi madre acaba de fallecer en el mes pasado, en este mes, los principios del mes, yo estoy contenta porque pienso que ahora el primero de noviembre ella regresará para estar con nosotros este, el día de que se festejan los fieles difuntos. Y ahí va a estar y, y ya en una dimensión donde ya todo está bien, ya no hay dolor, ya no hay nada, ¿no? Entonces ellos solo vienen para... She says, and also very important, she says, uh, for me, this year, at the beginning of this month, my mother died. But I'm happy, she says, because I know she's coming back on November 1st. No more pain, no more agony. They just come and be happy. Come and visit us. So Day of the Dead is uh, very important to, to all families of Mexico, and especially most families of Oaxaca and all the rural communities. Entonces, toca ponerle su ofrenda con todo lo que le gustaba, con artesanías que ella era lo que le gustaba hacer también. Entonces, este, es, es algo muy, muy significativo para nosotros, muy gratificante y muy estimulante para continuar con toda la tradición este, oral y de memoria y escrita y también con nuestra artesanía que sigue eh, documentando estas fechas tan importantes para los oaxaqueños. She says to us is very significant and especially this year for our for my mother we're going to add many of the things that I know she liked to make. Many of the items that she would make in life will be in the altar. And we like to do this because we want to continue perpetuate uh, not only in our memory, in written evidence, and definitely in our own traditions. 
this important event of the year. Look at that. Es Look at this un, beautiful sky. Es un, este, es un poquito de lo que hacemos. Just a sample of what, what, I, what I can do, she says. Y pues quisiéramos tener más tiempo para mostrarles muchas cosas más de lo que hacemos con nuestras manos, pero pues esta es una muestra nada más pequeña, ¿no? She says, we'd, we'd love to have more time to show you multiple things we can do with our hands, but at least this is an example of a scout. That is so beautiful. Thank you so much for sharing with us. And Adelina, it's been incredible to watch your progress with that work during this webinar. <laughs> un poco más de tiempo, pero este, yo hice todo más rápido para que vieran el proceso. ¿no? Uh -huh. She says it takes a longer, a longer time and needed more things, but at least I wanted to do something fast for you to see. Muchas gracias, increíble. Y yo tengo una pregunta. Uh, ¿Cómo se hace? Um, how did you make this, the face of the skull shiny? What was it that you put on the clay? Okay. Um, Typically, before the clay is fired, they have to make it, give it a sheen by actually uh, closing the pores by basically uh, rubbing it with a piece of agate. With a piece of agate. It's just a stone, a piece of agate. And with these, these stones, this is what you basically literally close the pores and make it shiny so that when the clay comes out it's black and shiny and not black matte. So this is a tradition that that she does for the overall skull but not for the flowers okay so she'll combine matte with shiny basically that's beautiful and actually Hearing you describe that, Florencio, I'm familiar with that process. It's actually referred to as burnishing. burnishing. Um, in English, you burnish the clay to, to close those pores, just as you described. And that combination of texture is amazing. Um, so as you were speaking, pretty much all of the questions that were put into the Q&A um, have been answered as you continued your presentation. So I'm just curious, it, would it be possible to to tour around or because I know that you moved to a different location? Is that possible to just spend a couple of minutes doing that? That would be amazing to see the environment. Thank you. I want everybody to see a photo of Adelina when she was four years old. Some of her honorific diplomas. And here's a good view of a lot of the work. Sí, señal. Is it all easily visible, Tina? Yes, yes. It's amazing to see the variety of works, as well as to see how prolific Adelina is. The well, multitude of works that she creates, it's beautiful. One thing also, like in the big pots, is that 
Adelina and a lot of the potters in this town do not make the use of a potter's wheel. This is a community that only uses inverted plates and actually works with coils. So this is all done by their hands. Very, very yeah. All hand building. That's amazing. Puebla, Mexico City. This is all hand built entirely. Just palomas, the doves. The, the patterns um, in the clay are also quite beautiful. Yes, a um, little bit of jewelry, of black pottery. Here's a Katrina with the chic hat. That's the Katrina. Adelina also makes tiles that have become extremely popular for people's homes, for offices. And she's, she's going to blow a traditional owl. It's a whistle owl. But the interesting thing about this is that it can be, it can give two different sounds. Can you speak a little bit about the tradition of the owl? Uh, la, la, la tradición del búho. Ajá, esto es una tradición porque los búhos también los utilizaban con fines medicinales, ¿no? Curaban de mal de ojo, de aire, de espanto, con un búho de estos. Um, I don't know if you're familiar, but, but a lot of people here have um, very animistic concepts of, uh, of our life, that if anyone gets ill, you may suffer susto, which is fright. You may suffer mal de ojo, which is evil eye. Uh, and many of these are illnesses that can be cured with both a cleansing and sound. Okay, so this is how owls uh, form a very important part of the tradition that the sound can awaken your inner spirit and can actually uh, throw away the evil spell or the fright or something that has that has you ill. For the color negro, que es muy impresionante, negro muy una energía muy fuerte. It's a much bigger owl. Corazón so anyhow this is adelina's work doesn't seem like much but it's a lot that her hands up it's amazing to see it all together thank you so much and once again uh the questions that were appearing um, pretty much all of them were answered throughout your presentation um i will uh include a comment uh, from Rebecca Zendeja saying, thank you so much. I have one of your calaveras and it sits with pride on my ofrenda every year. Muchas gracias. Ah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Muchas gracias. <laughs> gracias a usted. Yeah, that's wonderful. I love that connection. Um, so if there are no other questions for Florencio and Adelina, Oh, that is a beautiful piece. That is a beautiful yeah, piece. Very traditional. Oh, it's beautiful. Que obras increíbles, Adelina. Muchas gracias por compartir con nosotros. Really beautiful works. Showing you another one. She says that uh, these ones have that special bottom because before when there was no light, when there was no electricity, we would walk with these, okay, with three, uh, down the street.
Oh my gosh, that's amazing. That is beautiful. That is beautiful. Florencio and Adelina, thank you so much. Right now in the comments section, there are lots of thank yous and gratitude coming in. Muchas gracias. Somos muy agradecimiento a ustedes. We're very grateful to both of you um, for being here live with us. This is uh, just such a special event. And we really, really appreciate um, being able to virtually come into your studio, your space. And it was a pleasure to hear um, your stories and just the heritage of your artwork and how connected it is not only to your family, but also to your location, to your Pueblo. Um, and that is very meaningful, especially these days when we really are trying to find new ways to, to have and feel community. So thank you so much for providing us with such incredible examples of how to do that through art. So Florencio, please make sure that you translate that for Adelini, Adelina for me. And thank you for your interest and, and your nice words. This year is a very hard year. This year, many, many are sad. But the way we deal with Day of the Dead will be a good release to a lot of these very met up feelings that a lot of families are undergoing. Yes. I have a lot of friends that have lost people. And even though it's painful, like Adelina said, that her mom passed away at the beginning of October, this is a way with which she's going to be happy. She's going to finally connect with mother again in a few days. That's wonderful. Thank you so much. Be safe, be healthy. And that's important. Yes, yes. Thank you so, so much. Muchas gracias. Gracias al señor Florencio, una persona eh, pues muy, muy sensible a, 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 a apreciar las artes de Oaxaca. Y pues estamos muy agradecidos también con él porque está interesado en este proyecto que ojalá tenga mucho éxito. Y pues estamos en toda la disposición de seguir también nosotros eh, impulsando todo lo que nosotros requieran estamos listos para atenderles muchas gracias thank you Argentina thank you very much Florencio thank you Adelina gracias. take care thank you very much and for, take care and for our viewers if you are willing to stay on for just a moment longer we are actually going to put up some information a lot of you have been inquiring how to purchase Adelina's work. So, um, Elena, if you want to go ahead and um, put up that first slide, we can share with you information. Um, people are also asking about uh, the recording of this presentation. Um, so I would definitely uh, ask you to direct those inquiries to the Education Department of the Museum of Art, because we are recording this. And it's wonderful that so many of you would like to share this with others. Um, but right now you have a slide up with Adelina's information, her email address and her phone number. So uh, you can call her directly. Uh, wonderful to see her at work there in her studio. Um, and in addition, uh, for those of you who are interested, we also have um, a few slides that are just suggestions for anybody who may be interested or inspired or curious about how to start a home altar for Dia de los Muertos. And we're just gonna share with you some a few images um, from my own home. And just I'll, I'll, as an artist, I'll talk about the ways that I have gone about um, creating an altar at home. So Elena, if you wanna go ahead and start sharing those, okay. So, um, 2020 has been a hard year. So, you know, hearing that Adelina lost her mom this year, I it resonates with me. I lost my dad this year. So this is a portrait that I created of my dad a couple of years ago, and I have already been starting to build this altar to him at my house. This is a, a, a mantle. 
at my home so you can see some of the objects um, that I've started to collect um, in preparation for Dia de los Muertos. I didn't wait, you know, for those days. I've kind of already started to create it. As I say, I've been adding and kind of, you know, moving objects around on this altar. Um, Elena, you can go ahead and show the next slide. So specifically, um, and once again, these are just suggestions. Uh, maybe this will spark some inspiration for those of you who are interested. Um, objects that represent the person that you want to honor. Um, maybe objects from the location where they're from. So this is a fan that was made in the Philippines along with some seashells that came from the Philippines as well. Um, Elena, you can show the next slide, please. And, you know, I loved how Florencio and Adelina spoke so much about the aromatics, about the scents that not only draw the spirits to your home, but also remind us because that olfactory sense is so powerful and connected to memory. And so I do try to include um, something that has a, an aroma to it. So I make my own um, sage smudges from hummingbird sage that I have planted in my yard. Um, in the center there, that's a, a cedar branch smudge. And then on the far right, that is a stick of uh, Palo Santo. I also include votives for that illumination to light the way. Um, and paz en el hogar, it means peace in the home. Um, so Elena, thank you. You can move on to the next slide. And then personal objects. Any personal objects that you may have that represent uh, the person or even a metaphor for, you know, who that person was or their, their life or, you know, just something from the past history. So a personal object uh, feels appropriate for me on an altar. Um, thank you, Elena. You can show the next slide. And animal spirits, um, that's something that Florencio was talking about too, about the animalistic kind of nature of beliefs. I, I share that. I have a big connection with animals and I'm very fascinated by the symbolism of animals. And so it can be figures of your choice. There's no right or wrong here. So uh, that's a ceramic uh, portrait of a, a dog of mine that I created. And then I also have some you know plastic animal figurines that both have been gifted to me and uh, one that I chose so it's really up to you but the animal spirits for me are very important as well. Thanks Elena you can move on to the next slide. And then um, handmade or handwritten cards there's something about uh, the human hand that is a very important element to me too. You know, when something is handwritten or handmade, um, that's like a trace of a human um, that has, you know, time traveled from their home to mine. And so that's something that I very much appreciate and is very meaningful to me. And I like to include those on my altars as well. Um, thank you, Elena. You can move on to the next slide. And I think that this might be the final one. Um, objects from nature are something that I tend to include in my home altars as well. So in the foreground, you can see um, that is some hummingbird sage in different stages of uh, drying out. Um, and that is also very aromatic in its different phases of drying. Um, that is a dry magnolia leaf uh, in the center. And I'm fascinated by magnolia trees in general. I, their symbolism is really wonderful. But I also love the way that the leaves change, you know, when they're new, they're very light green and supple. And then they get a little bit more firm and dark green. And then when they drop, they're leathery and almost suede like on the bottom and create these very sculptural forms. And I see that as a metaphor for our humanity and our lives. Um, so that's why that is included on my personal altar. And then that feather, um, I, I like to believe that that's an eagle feather from uh, this hike that I do where an eagle was soaring over me. So that's also a good animal spirit symbol for me. Um, and I think those are the final slides of just once again, suggestions from my home altar. Um, but I hope that if you decide to make 
an altar at home honoring someone for Dia de los Muertos that you enjoy it and that you find some inspiration, um, not just from the slides that we just shared with you, but also from the work of Adelina and a lot of the information that Florencio shared with us from these deep traditions and heritages that come from Oaxaca. Um, so thank you so much for joining us this morning. Um, and Elena has just typed in that a recording of this event will be made available on the museum's YouTube page. Thank you, Elena, for including that information. Um, thank you so much for joining us. I hope everyone enjoys the rest of your Sunday. And once again, Tina Villa from Santa Barbara Museum of Art. Thanks very much, everyone. <laughs>